ladies and gentlemen, do welcome to the next episode of my Save Bet show. And uh, it's a great privilege and also gives me a lot of fresh pleasure because we have successfully worked together in the past to welcome Mr. Adam Burrington on the show, Vice President Responsible Gaming at Underdog Sports. Good to have you, Adam. How are you doing? Martin, I am doing great today. Thank you for having me. And how are you doing? Hope it's a good day for you. It's been a good day so far, and now we're filming. We'll make it even better. So Adams had an illustrious and a very successful career across a few industries. But let me start, also geographically speaking, at Michigan State. You're a Michigan State alum. You obtained a BA in Arts and History over there. First of all, and funnily enough, that seems to be the combo a lot of folks like you and me that end up leading ESG or responsible gambling programs, even beyond the gambling industry for big corporations, seem to have opted for. So do you believe that's the winning ticket for these purposes? Well, I like the thesis, Martin. So I like the thesis very much. And uh, I'm very proud Michigan State uh, alum I'm from the great state of Michigan. Uh, I originally thought I wanted to be a lawyer, and my plan was to get my BA in history and then go to law school. I did work in a law firm for a few months after graduating from Michigan State and quickly learned from A, the work, and B, speaking with the lawyers I was working with. That was not the path I wanted to choose, so I ended up going on, on a different path. But I think the skills I learned from getting my, my undergraduate degree, um, reading, analyzing, writing in long form is translated nicely to our current field now. Uh, regulatory environments in multiple jurisdictions is complex. Uh, understanding how you do or don't fit in, uh, if you have an argument to form, that all benefit from my undergraduate degree. So I think it set me up very nicely and it's a degree that I think you can do many things with uh, later in life. Absolutely. Well, to call the regulatory environment complex might even be an understatement. And look at me, although I've made this joke before, I'm pretty much a failed lawyer. I ended up doing podcasts, so it may not be the path to take. But on a much, rather slightly more serious note, you know, as a kid growing up in the Czech Republic, I did spend lots of even days of watching and re-watching the good old police academy movie franchise. Mm. So I cannot but ask you about another famous alum of Michigan State, namely Bubba Smith, before your time, but he had a great football career and then he had a great acting career and sadly he passed away still relatively young. So is Bubba still considered one of the legends of the Spartans and the boy, the Michigan State community? I mean, it, it warms my heart that you bring up the great Bubba Smith. Absolutely, yes. Michigan State won six national championships in football in the 1950s and 1960s before our time. Uh, Bubba was involved in two of them. He was the best player in two of them in 1965 and 1966. Had a Hall of Fame career in professional football as well. It's interesting because he, he segued into acting when you and I were, were kids and, and kind of grew up and watching that. I think people our age and, and younger or even older either forget or overlook how great of a football player he was. So absolutely a Michigan State legend. Um, and uh, he is well regarded uh, in East Lansing. And God should rest his soul. And yes. indeed, to, to your point, because... Let's say football, as in American football, is not really a, a thing where I'm from. So I've had a steep learning curve over the last 15 years. But just like many other folks, I simply didn't know about Baba's football career or that there was one before his acting career. A great, great career. A great, legendary career. Well, I'll be off on one of my many business trips tonight. There's a method to this madness. And on the way to the Newark Liberty Airport, I'll be passing the Anheuser Busch Brewery or Anheuser Busch Factory. So in your case, following numerous corporate communications roles in all your previous lives, you ultimately landed with uh, Anheuser Busch. 
and amongst many other things, launched a couple of well-known corporate social responsibility programs like Drink Wise or their emergency drinking water program. So could you tell us a bit more about these campaigns? Yes, I uh, worked in the beer industry for, for about a decade and eight of those years at Anheuser-Busch and had the privilege of, of leading their corporate social responsibility team in my, in my last role there. Uh, the Drink Wiser campaign was with the Budweiser brand. So Budweiser is a brand that is known really worldwide, obviously here in the U.S. And, and you might have some thoughts as a, as a Czech native we could get into, Martin. Love to hear that. Um, but using the power of that brand and whether you drink the beer or not, you know of Budweiser. So we created a, a campaign called Drink Wiser, which had two hopefully very simple calls to action. One was plan ahead for a safe ride home. In today's day and age, there is zero excuse to drink and drive with technology we have at hand. And that led to a partnership with Uber as well, a uh, very successful partnership uh, for both companies, as well as the social norm of hydrate between buds. I'm not telling you not to drink. I'm encouraging you to moderate your drinking uh, by slowing down and drinking water in between the beers you might concern. So plan ahead for a safe ride home. Hydrate Between Buds, that was the, the foundation of Drink Wiser, which we executed at a national level with TV commercials at the local level, working with the wholesalers, which is a huge part of the alcohol business in the United States. And our Zabush's Emergency Drinking Water Program is, is a program I had the honor of being a part of for a number of years. It's been going for nearly 40 years now. And water, as people may know, is the core component of beer. Any beer you drink is about 85, 90% water. So at two Anheuser Bush breweries, um, they would pause production a couple of times a year and can water uh, and label as emergency drinking water. And that led to a great partnership with the American Red Cross. In times of need, earthquake, hurricane, the local water supply might be compromised. Anheuser Bush and their wholesalers could deliver that water locally, hand out to the Red Cross, drink the water to those in times of need for hydration and, and basic things like cooking, brushing your teeth, et cetera, if you don't have water locally. I had the honor of, of expanding that program. I was with Anheuser-Busch. Uh, we did it more proactively. We worked with volunteer firefighters across the country. These are unpaid positions in small communities across the U.S. And hydration is a key need when you're fighting fires. It can be eight, 900 degrees if you're actually actively fighting a blaze. There's no budget line item for water for these men and women who are risking their lives, local heroes. So we went to partner with local fire departments to proactively deliver canned drinking water to them. So those men and women could have access to hydration, could bring with them um, as they were going and doing their, their volunteer jobs and protecting their communities. So it was really a proactive extension of a, a longstanding program to support uh, natural disasters to help local volunteer mm -hmm. firefighters. Needless to say, very commendable programs. So thank you for having paid or for having played rather a very instrumental role in launching them. Before we move on to briefly discuss the US Czech Republic IP and trademark wars in connection with Budweiser, and I will certainly have a few thoughts about that. I will use the next question as a segue into talking about responsible gambling in a few minutes. But Policy and strategy wise, because you've experienced, you have plenty of experience in both sectors. Do you perceive any inherent differences between responsible or even irresponsible drinking and responsible or irresponsible gambling or gaming? So I'll focus my answer on the US market, which is, of course, where we are right now and my experience mainly is. You know, both products can do harm, right? As we know, uh, over consumption of alcohol, you can do physical harm to your body. And of course, the worst situation is getting behind the wheel of a vehicle and putting others' lives at risk. So the education there is paramount and critical. And that's something the alcohol industry, I think, has done a, a good to very good job of for a number of decades. Of course, uh, irresponsible gambling can cause great financial and mental harm uh, as well to you, as, as you and I both very deeply know. The large difference between the two is Again, in the US, whether you're a brewer like Anheuser-Busch or a distiller, whatever you may be um, creating and selling, you lose track of that to a degree. So in the United States, for those who don't know, we have a three-tier system. So you brew the beer, which you then sell to a wholesaler, who then distributes it to a local restaurant, a bar, a sporting venue, what have you, whereas then purchase and consumed. 
that is all tracked, but the brewer itself doesn't have access to the data of how many beers you and I might be drinking. They use you, know, you and I's examples, Martin. Obviously, in responsible gambling, we have far more data. We understand how long our consumers are playing with our products, how much they're wagering with, are they chasing their losses? So there are similarities, I think, in terms of pushing social norms and evolving the conversation around these two topics. Responsible drinking has a, a large head start in our country, I think, in understanding where 40 years ago, we might make fun of irresponsible drinking in the way that now mainstream media sometimes can make fun of irresponsible gambling. The understanding isn't there. We need to evolve the dialogue, operators, regulators, the general public on what irresponsible gambling looks like, how friends and family can intervene, and of course, more importantly, the resources available uh, to anyone who might want help uh, and to talk to someone who's an expert about their gambling. So similarities, yes, but the amount of data and the way we can connect with customers is very, very different in, in the online gambling space versus the alcohol space in the US. We shall leave the legal Budweiser related bottles, I mean, to the lawyers, because as we've already established, neither of us is a practicing lawyer, in my case, any, any longer, but on the assumption of them that you would have tasted both of them, which one? Do you find, no pressure, which one do you find tastier, the American Bud or the Czech Budweiser? I have tasted both. And uh, my answer will be this, Martin. So beer is meant to be consumed as fresh as possible, as you probably know. Beer is a food product, right? So the fresher, the better. So my answer is going to be whichever one is fresher at the moment that I'm consuming it is most likely my preference. Having said that, Anheuser-Busch and the Budweiser brand has been very good to me and my family. So my loyalty will, will always be there if you, if you force me to pick. Fresher beer at the end of the day, but if you force me blind to pick between the two, I will go with U.S. Budweiser. That's all fair enough. Adam and I may meet up later right in front of the Anheuser-Busch factory and uh, down a few, but I shall digress and move, if I may, onto Fenduel, because you've entered, I want a better expression, the fray of the gambling industry right there. You let a great team my own personal experience, tossed effectively with all things gambling. But amongst others, you developed an RG ambassador program and also launched Fendil's very first Play Well Day. This may be a leading question, of course, but how important is it to have an RG ambassador that can speak right to people's hearts and minds? And which categories of personalities, in your view, work best to fit that particular bill or for these purposes? Yeah, to me, there's a lot of great learnings from the alcohol industry that, that translated to, to my tenure at FanDuel. And certainly one was working with notable influencers, third parties um, to help push a message of responsibility. So when it comes to FanDuel's Responsible Gaming Ambassador Program, I think there's two types of work. First and foremost, if there's someone with lived experience, there's going to be a credibility to their story. And Fanduel has long worked with a gentleman named Craig Carton, who is national, uh, now a national uh, sports radio host on Fox Sports One, previously a New York City uh, sports radio talk show host known around here. Craig has been very open uh, about his issues with problem gambling, that he's an addict and wants others to learn from his story. Someone who is very successful, top of his field, making very, very good money. Uh, problem gambling, as you and I both very well know, Martin, can impact anybody. Doesn't matter where your your career, financial, whatever your status may may be. So lived experience has an authenticity that is second to none, which I hope that you agree with. You now the other is someone who is a very prominent leader in their sport. Someone who, whether it's a, a boxer, whether it's a golfer, a tennis player, a baseball player, whatever that may be, if they're an active participant, meaning they're at the top of their game, that message is going to resonate too. Uh, again, the message of moderation, setting a budget, understand that it's meant to be entertainment. You know, don't be afraid to set a time, a wager, a deposit limit. There's an authenticity, authenticity there because they're reaching the young men and young women who are just coming into legal age uh, to bet with legal operators. Again, they, they have a, a cachet that 
you know, a spokesperson from an operator themselves or a regulator or an elected official might not have with a 21, 22, 23 year old. So lived experience, number one, and anyone who's active in their sport, number two, giving that message to really understand your plan, what it's meant to be for. Let's talk about Craig a little bit, because uh, of course you've had much more exposure to and dealings with him. I've had some, and he's quite a character, wouldn't you say? Yes, he is. Craig has lived quite a life. Craig has remarkable stories. But the most impressive thing about Craig in my time I've got to spend with him is I have seen him on countless occasions give out his phone number to people who come up to him and tell either a personal story or story of a loved one. And he has put himself out there to be a resource for those people behind the scenes, to be a sympathetic ear and to give some suggestive advice, again, because of the credibility he has from his lived experience. So there's an unselfish to Craig to want to help that uh, has impressed me, which is very different behind the scenes from his on-camera personality, which is uh, quite a showman, which he's developed over the year at radio and TV. Absolutely. Let's move on to talk about your latest venture, if you will, Underdog, I suppose we all love an Underdog. Yes. As a Patriots fan, that's what I've had to learn lately. Might change in the next 30 years, but I shall digress on a serious note yet again. You serve as Underdog's vice president, all things responsible gambling, and I have pretty much Following your guidance, used your own LinkedIn words to draft the next question. In Underdog, you're working with a fantastic team to help further enhance Underdog's innovative, I'm quoting, responsible gaming resources aimed at providing users with the safest gaming platform on the market. So would you mind elaborating on what this means in practical terms, how you, your team, and the boy, the underdog organizations been engaging with the folks out there when it comes to, I suppose, in underdog's case, both responsible gambling or sports betting, but also gaming over to the existing setup behind the business? Yeah, I'm glad you asked, Martin. There's really two points that have stuck out to me during my tenure at Underdog. One is the culture. And I have worked at companies that had great cultures as well. This is not anything against them. But the culture at Underdog is different. And the care and the understanding with everything that is done, are we thinking about the RG implications and or opportunities? Everything we do, we communicate or build. And it's been unique for me because Underdog, as, as we record this, is about to uh, enter the online sports betting space in, in North Carolina. It's a new product. And they have the opportunity to work with product and tech teams as this product has been built and the roadmap is formed. And how RG has been at the heart of everything we're trying to do as we build out this product has been a very unique experience uh, from our product leaders to our CEOs. Everything has been done with RG at the center. And it pleases me to no end. And again, prior employers, RG was critically important as well. But at Underdog, we have really taken it to a new level in terms of how we're building the product and how it's placed RG throughout the roadmap process. In addition, uh, we announced uh, a responsible gaming innovation fund, which we're calling Guard Dog. We're pledging at least $1 million in funding to support and accelerate startups that are focusing on creative and new solutions to address problem gambling and further responsible gaming. We need more technology to implement into our platforms, to detect consumers might be having issues, to intervene with those consumers, and if they need assistance uh, for treatment to help them on a treatment path as well. So we're aiming to put our money where our mouth is. We're incorporating it in the product itself, and we really want to help fund startups focused on RG technologies, uh, help implement them both into Underdog's platform, yes, of course, but into anyone in the space, because responsible gaming at the end of the day is always meant to be collaborative. It's not competitive. So yet another very commendable Warrington-led project to make this world a better place. I suppose... In light of what you've just said, clearly there's much more to it, but with the fact that you're putting responsible gambling and I suppose also all the wider pro consumer protection processes, protocols, and policies right at the heart of your product, 
is that what you believe is underdogs winning proposition for its patrons? Is that kind is this the kind of crowd that you're seeking to attract? Somebody who would like to have fun, have some entertainment while on your side, but having, from what I've gathered, a hundred percent guarantee that their well being is fully protected by one of you, if you pardon the pun, of one of your many guard dogs. Yes. No, I like the pun. Yeah. To me, the formula is two ways, Martin. One, like you said, is if you view underdog as a playground, it's the safest playground possible. You're meant to have fun. You're meant to have a safe experience. We want you to come back as often as, as you choose and feel protected in everything you do. By also the investment we're trying to do through guard dogs, implementing new technologies as frequently as possible to enhance player protection. We've made great strides in player protection in this market since the online market really started here in 2018. We have a long ways to go. I am very confident you and I agree on this as essentially all of your guests on the show have agreed upon. How do we do that? How do we work together? Uh, how do we implement technology? At the end of the day, we need to make it as easy for consumers as possible to feel protected and turn those protections on while also intervening as frequently as possible uh, before it's too late and someone's in a really dangerous situation. So it's building the product. It's having alignment of the product and tech teams, the, the, the men and women who are building and maintaining these products that for the operators we work for, as well as investing in new technologies and making sure those technologies are implemented on the roadmap to enhance player protection. To me, that's the winning formula. It's about today and tomorrow. In the same spirit, ultimately, this is called the Safe Bet Show. For a few minutes, if I may kick it up to the lofty heights of what may be a somewhat philosophical debate, you've already alluded to the fact that I've had the absolute privilege and honor to host some of the other distinguished and I would definitely count you amongst them, responsible gambling and why the CSR folks that have been molding and shaping this industry. So in your view, here comes the question, because I did ask them the same question. What is the current state of play of problem gambling, responsible gambling in the United States of America? Or in other words, do you believe that as an industry, Yet again, across both the gambling and gaming space, are we doing enough or is there a further need to step up on this front? We're not doing enough. There's absolutely a further need to do more. And I always try to look at this at a macro level as much as possible. So first and foremost, with both my background and, and some of the projects that I've, I've been privileged to be a part of, if everyone in the organization is in partnering with you, it's most likely going to be a futile effort, right? So yes, we talked about the product itself and the product and tech teams, but your marketing team needs to be on board too. They are they are owning and controlling the channels of communication, whether that's paid, earned media, social media as well. They need to be a key partner in a sharing what you believe and communicating to your customers on how to play responsibly. I'm a huge believer in social norms. You need to talk to people, not talk at people. Now, as we look at the problem gambling market in the US, certainly there's deeper understanding than there was five, six years ago about the nature of addiction and problem gambling. But we still use terms like degenerate. We still, to a degree, make fun of it. And I think there's somewhat of a common belief among many that you can just stop. It's that simple. You have a problem with your gambling, just stop gambling. We would never treat an alcoholic or a drug addict like that. There's a deeper understanding now. We would most likely, hopefully, not make fun of someone who has a drug or alcohol problem. In pop culture, and as we're recording this, there was a, 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 a commercial parody on Saturday Night Live last weekend, essentially making fun of problem gamblers. Um, that's what many people think of a problem gambling of the industry as a whole. So we are at a crossroads um, as well. Media is paying more attention to problem gambling, as you and I well know. We need to do more collectively to educate consumers on how to play. It's meant to be for entertainment. If you're looking this way to make money. You're looking at the wrong way. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to be safe. And you have to put guardrails on your play. And if you don't, there's a potential you get into trouble. So we have to change the narrative at the macro level. And that goes to the pop culture level. So with that, there, there's still a lot of work to be done. Would there be any particular areas that you believe would need to be addressed with 
urgency, if you will, not only because I agree we do want to spare ourselves the pieces like the one on Saturday Night Live that, from a problem gambler's perspective, has most definitely missed the mark. So to me, there's also lessons from the alcohol industry, and I go to my past life frequently. So the notion of drinking and driving 40, 50 years ago was somewhat socially accepted. You and I might go somewhere, we might have four or five beers or whatever we're drinking, get in our cars and go home, and, and no one unfortunately thought much of it. What the industry did and went beyond the beer industry and the alcohol industry was go into writer's rooms of popular TV shows at the time. So shows like Cheers and LA Law in the 1980s to introduce the concept of designated driver. There was no internet then to kind of widespread push a concept like that. You needed to hit as many people as possible. Popular TV shows was a vehicle to do that. World is very, very different now. And media, of course, is far more fractured than before. But we need to work beyond the industry and sometimes the echo chamber that is our industry, which I suspect you agree with, to go more widespread to hit young men and young women, either who are of legal gambling or gaming age or not yet legal, to educate them on how to moderate their play and what they should be looking at. We have to figure out a way to do this collectively as an industry and go far beyond because um, it's in everyone's best interest to do so. There are lessons from alcohol I think that we should heed to push a culture of responsibility. It's really a culture of understanding and moderating your play. Again, today, if you and I go and meet somewhere and I have too much to drink, you probably order me an Uber and A, I most likely would be supportive, but more importantly, everyone around us would be very supportive of you doing that. How do we get to that point with online gambling? How do we understand socially how to intervene, flag somebody's play? They are not directly comparable, of course, because you don't show physical signs like you do with alcohol and online gambling always to kind of do that. So I think the opportunity is multi-stakeholder. It's long-term, but we have to educate as soon as we can um, to avoid outcomes that none of us want. Quite a few excellent points right there. I will not name any names, but another way of phrasing what you've just suggested would be what one of the big wigs in one of the organizations I used to work with many, 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 many months ago used to say, well, if something's working in another industry, just steal the idea and deploy it right here. So that may be the way of learning the lessons from the alcohol industry you have just alluded to. Steal with pride. To. Steal with pride. Steal, steal with pride. Before we move on to the home straight, I will be asking Adam, as I tend to do on these podcasts, about his sporting heroes and then give him 60 seconds to summon his name in the history even more firmly. One final specific point. This time, the GRIT Act, as in G-R-I-T, so the GRIT with a D, at the end. To my knowledge, Underdog is the first organization from within our space to have thrown its weight behind the GRIT Act. For those, arguably very few who might not know, it's a measure bill spearheaded by the NCPG at the Hill level, i.e. the US federal legislative level effectively designed to increase federal funding for problem gambling causes. So two, hopefully brief questions, Adam. Why is it that you guys, and I believe it's commendable, threw your way behind the act? And do you believe that, if you pardon yet another pun, the GRIT Act is gritty enough and will achieve its purpose if approved? So the reason why, and I'm extremely proud that the underdog is supporting the GRID Act, there's a need. There's a need for federal resources to a problem gambling research, problem gambling treatment, and ideally problem gambling prevention. So the GRID Act's gonna take existing tax dollars paid by legal operators to help fill the current funding gap, right? There are currently no federal funds allocated for problem gambling. And I'm proud to say underdog supports directing existing tax dollars uh, as this industry grows, online gaming, online gambling grows in the United States. Uh, there's a clear need. Um, we need to start here. Is it gritty enough to, to use your phrasing? Time will tell. It's a key and critical step as we need uh, protected federal dollars uh, to aid research, prevention, and treatment of problem gambling. 
We talked about the legend of Baba Smith these days. The two of us don't actually live too far from each other in the great garden state of New Jersey. So before we do move on to the 60 seconds for you to shine, would you mind telling the audience which sporting teams you root for? Please don't say the Giants. And are there any besides good old Bubba, any other sporting heroes that feature very top of your of your list? Yes. So I uh, do live here in Montclair, New Jersey right now. Uh, I care about four teams too much. So I uh, mentioned Michigan State, Michigan State football and basketball. Uh, I over-index emotionally without a doubt. Uh, from the Midwest, I lived in Chicago for over a decade. I, I met my wife there and both my sons were born downtown Chicago. Uh, I'm a huge Chicago Cubs and Chicago Bears fan. I had the privilege of, of splitting season tickets to both those teams for a number of years before, before my children were born. So I had the privilege of seeing the Cubs win the World Series in 2016 after 108 years. I feel privileged. Yes, we'd like to have another one or, 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 or more than one more in my lifetime, but had to have one. Uh, and then the Bears were a team from my youth, grew up a Bears fan. And Walter Payton, the great running back from the Bears, number 34, in my opinion, without a doubt, the greatest running back of all time and, and certainly one of the greatest players of all time. Uh, an exemplary uh, example on the field with his effort and his giving to his community off the field. So Walter Payton's a hero, as is the great Magic Johnson. I was way too young when he played at Michigan State. I admired him when he was playing for the Los Angeles Lakers. I named a cat Magic Johnson. We called him Magic growing up to just showcase my, my love of magic. So Magic Johnson and Walter Payton are, are two all-time idols and heroes in sports. Truly magical answers and no issues, at least at my end, with over-indexation on sport and I suppose the underdog theme, especially with all due respect when it comes to the Bears, came back in. But now, 60 seconds for Mr. Boring to, to convey his messages, whatever they may be. But of course, ideally, we'd like to hear both gambling industry and responsible gambling. Yeah. So we're on a journey, and it's such a critical journey for all of us, right? So the employer I work for, with now and, and before takes responsible gaming extremely seriously. Uh, and really that really began on day one. So RG has to be built in the foundation of your product and everything you're doing to communicate about your product externally. We are making progress there, uh, but we have to do more. We need more stakeholders involved, team partners, league partners in the sporting realm, elected officials, regulators. How can we do this in a way that helps us build a sustainable industry for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. And also Martin, as, as you uh, have deep expertise in how do we understand the lessons from, from Europe, particularly Western Europe and things that those jurisdictions did well and things perhaps they didn't do well and maybe overcorrected in terms of regulations. It's a tremendous opportunity we have collectively uh, to shape how consumers play with our products today, but how they shape it in five, 10, 15 years. So as a parent, that's paramount to me. Amen to that. And thank you, Adam, ladies and gentlemen. This was Mr. Adam Warrington, currently serving as VP Responsible Gaming at Underdog Sports. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Martin Lechka. This has been the latest episode of the Safe Bet Show. Do see you next time.